Hello, folks. Welcome back. This is Shingi Mavima, and uh, thank you for joining us on, on this edition of our African History Lecture Series. And in case you're wondering what's up with starting the video with a song, well, that song is Nkose Sikeleli, Africa, a originally Kosa song written in 1897, and it translates to, it translates to God Bless Africa. Um, it went on to become a, a, an important song in the anti-colonial movement and is uh, the national anthem of South Africa today, as well as for, for more than a decade after independence was the anthem of Zimbabwe, uh, Zambia, and these other places as well. So it's, it's a very important song. And I think it dovetails perfectly with what we are talking about today, which is the idea of pre-colonial Christianity in Africa and the advent of Christian missionary culture in Africa. Um, so let's, let's get right into it. All right, hold on. Let's uh, share the screen here. All right, there we go. So so far we've spoken about we've we've spoken about the the advent of the uh, transatlantic slave trade, the end thereof. We've also spoken about commerce in the aftermath of of the slave trade, West African commerce in the aftermath of the transatlantic slave trade. What did people do that had been so dependent on the on the on the slave trade? And and we've spoken about all these things. And now we are we are on the precipice of the scramble for Africa, which we'll be talking about in the following video. Um, but now we are talking about the sort of Christian missionary culture that came with, uh, with European imperialism. So that's what we'll be talking about today, uh, this Christian imperial, the way in which Christianity was a handmaiden of, um, of European imperialism. So strap in. So what you find is, even though, as you will see, the advent of, of Christian missionary culture as led by Europeans was not until the 15th century in Africa, it is important to ascertain that Christianity was present in Africa way before that, right? If you... Um, if you read uh, the, the Bible or otherwise, you will, not, you will know of several references to, to Ethiopia, Egypt. Uh, Simon of Cyrene, uh, who helped Jesus carry the cross, was, uh, you know, Cyrene is, is, is in Libya. Um, these different things, right? So, but, but, but that, that's biblical, and I don't want to spend too much time getting in that. I'm, you know, I'm just asserting that there was a presence, an African presence even then. But this is more um, to... to, uh, to uh, verifiable history. Here are a few pictures that I figured would get us started on this conversation of uh, Christianity in pre-colonial, pre-imperial Africa. So the first picture here, uh, going from from left to right, uh, the first picture over here is the is the Church of Alexandria, which was founded by Saint Mark, who was one of the disciples in 42 A.D. Right, one of the one of the uh, folks, you know, you talk about Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John in the Bible. Uh, Mark founded this church in Alexandria, Egypt, which was one of the first bish Christian bishoprics, uh, Catholic bishoprics. Right, that's the Church of Saint Alexandria in Egypt. Uh, next here we have uh, Saint Augustus of Hippo from the fourth century Algeria, whose writings went on to influence the development of Western Church and Western philosophy and it directly all of Western Christianity. So he was from Algeria. Next to him, we have uh, St. Moses, the, you know, who's often called St. Moses the Black, also from, fourth and, from the fourth and fifth century Egypt, who was a servant of a government official in Egypt. 
and who earlier on had been dismissed as a, a for, for theft and suspected murder and who led a, a, a group of, of, of bandits along the Nile Valley until he had a Damascus Road moment and went on to become one of the most influential um, saints and, and, and figures in, in, in early Christianity, early African Christianity, but early Christianity as a whole. In this image here, you have this uh, Bible, which is written in, in Jez, Jez, G-E-E-Z, uh, which was a, 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 a forerunner of Amharic um, in, 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 Ethiopian, um, in, in, in Ethiopian linguistics. So, sorry, I mean Aramaic. And this book, this book was discovered, you know, in the 21st century, but it's the oldest, most complete Bible found, and it's also the first illustrated Bible. And it is said to have been um, discovered. Uh, it is said to have been um, from four. It's supposed to. It's said to be from 494 AD. So that's also fifth century. Then over here, that's in Ethiopia, found in a monastery in Ethiopia. And over here we have, uh, I believe this is the State Church of St. George, which is one of several churches built in Lalibela, Ethiopia, in the 12th century as a form of resistance to um, Islamic, um, uh, you know, in, in, in intrusions and, and the, the potential for, I remember at the time that uh, Muslim Islam was spreading rapidly across the region and he had conquered several other places. Um, but this was one that uh, the, the Ethiopians were, were one of the few spaces that were able to resist this, this incursion. So this is one of the churches. And the amazing thing about it is it's built underground and it's just rock that's carved out to make this church. So this is, the idea here is to emphasize that Christianity had been present on the continent even prior to, to slavery and European imperialism as we got to know it. But now let's talk about European Christians in pre-colonial Africa. Uh, please don't mind the, I think somebody's doing some work back here. So if you hear those blasts, uh, you know, you know, I'm not in a war zone or anything like that. Uh, in any case, so European Christian, uh, Christians in, in pre-colonial Africa, right? Now, this is what we are talking about. We're talking about starting in the 1480s when the age of European exploration uh, brings, uh, you know, the Portuguese and other folks to the, to the, to the African uh, coasts. So together with the age of exploration, remember we spoke about, if you watched our previous videos, we spoke about the Portuguese coming in and setting up the plantations in Sao Tome and Principe of the coast of West Africa, which became the blueprint for slavery in the Americas. Together with that, um, as big a Catholic uh, empire as they were, they were accompanied, of course, by, by, by their Catholic uh, missionaries at the time. Um, at which point you see they established, you know, they tried to get into Benin, into Congo, the, the missionaries that is even further down to the, to the south in, in Zimbabwe, trying to convert the Monomotapa in the, in the, 16th, in the 16th century. Uh, but in the 15th century, or, and they also tried to convert, you know, a Jesuit group tried to convert the Ethiopian uh, community. However, they did not know already that there was a solid Christian culture in Ethiopia that had gone on for, for more than a, a, a thousand years at this point. So they were not able to break into that. And altogether, these early incursions, this 15th and 16th century incursions by, by, by Catholic and other Christian missionaries have had very little impact, right? Because only less than 1% of non-Muslim Africans had been converted to Christianity by 1880, you know, uh, and we are excluding, of course, Ethiopia because it has a longer tradition. And we are also excluding um, the Sudan, which if you know, we talked about the Coptic church of Nubia, but for every other place, less than 1%. But some of the earlier folks that they had converted were, some of the folks that were converted earlier were over here uh, is the Maninkongo Zingaku. Uh, he was the ruler of the Congo region at the time, Zingaku. Zinga Ku, who was uh, baptized in 1491. He may be the very first 
African ruler to be baptized, at least sub-Saharan African ruler to be baptized by uh, European missionaries in 1491. And um, a lot of it, part of it was of course, the religious appeal of, of Christianity, but a lot of it was, it was a political move, right? Because um, this connection with the Portuguese, uh, you know, allowed him to increase his power. The Portuguese soldiers aided in suppressing rebellions from, from neighboring groups um, and such. So when he was, when he was baptized, his name became Joao the first, Joao the first, right? J-O-A-O, -O, you know, like, like John, John in, in, in Portuguese, Joao the first, and that's him depicted here. However, this was not, it was not easy for him to tear himself away from, uh, you know, to, to abide by all the, the requirements of, of Christianity, which included abandoning important traditional practices, um, and eventually he actually fell out. And by the time he died, he had, uh, for, you know, he had backslid, if you will call it that, and was again abiding by, um, by African, uh, by his traditional African uh, spirituality practices. That's King Joao. Now, but his son, on the other hand, his son had, yeah, and this son is pictured here, he had two sons, um, and they became a prototypical dispute for succession in which the other son represented traditional African spirituality, spirituality and cultural practices. Whereas his other son who is pictured here is Alfonso the first, right? Who was, who was, um, that's how he was baptized. And after he was baptized, Alfonso the first went and studied in Portugal for 10 years and returned what people describe as more of a European prince than an African one. So, so there's him who represents sort of this Western, uh, Western value system and, and Catholicism and his other, and his brother who had stayed at home and represented the virtues of, of African uh, traditional um, practices. And because Alfonso had the backing of the, the Portuguese, when his father died, he became the, the new king in 1506. And was very, very important. Um, and we may talk about him a little more later, but he was one of the pivotal figures uh, in the slave trade, uh, was very much allied with the Europeans and in, in enslaving Africans. So this is, a, this is a forerunner to see the ways in which Christianity became a handmaiden of the imperial project. So that's a little bit about, about these guys. However, like I said, this is all in the 15th, in the 16th, 15th and 16th century. The, the work of Christians was, of Christian missionaries was very much limited in these areas, which is why, as we say, only less than 1% of non-Muslim Africans had been converted. It doesn't really kick off, the missionary culture doesn't really kick off until the end of the 18th century, in the late 1700s. And it coincides with the decline in the slave trade, okay? The decline in the slave trade and the rise of, of um, you know, the, 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 we're on the eve of colonialism here. So these evangelical missionaries, most of them who were also abol abol abolitionists, believe that non-Muslim Africans had no religion at all, which is of course false, but that was their belief. Uh, everything African was heathen to them, including, you know, everything from dancing to singing, to the way folks live, to, to polygamy, uh, to various cultural practices, everything that was not theirs or Muslim was heathen to them. So, and they offered a sense of salvation and hope to the downtrodden. And this is very important to, 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 to consider that let's ask yourself why the Africans they were talking about were downtrodden at the time, you know? A lot of them were due to, to things like enslavement and the repercussions that had, the oppression that had come from, from their own kings or, or their, the other African kings uh, capturing them and enslaving them for the purpose of shipping them off. So it's, it's already very hypocritical, right? But in any case, this is how they were thinking about it. Okay. So two of the countries we have already spoken about in our last presentation, that really represent this advent of Christian missionary culture on the continent. And these are uh, 
over here we have uh, Liberia, which we spoke about, which was founded by the uh, American Colonization Society uh, in the early 19th century, as well as Sierra Leone, which had been founded by, by different groups, including the Christian Missionary Society. Um, uh, so uh, this one was, was, you know, Liberia was, was, was founded by repatriated African-American slaves, whereas uh, Sierra Leone, some of them were African-American slaves as well, but uh, they included Jamaican Maroons. And this was done, this was a product of the a project of the British in particular. And many of the people who were repatriated were people who had fought on the British side in the American uh, War for Independence, American Revolutionary War. So we've, we, again, watched the previous video for, for more details on these particular countries. But I just thought it would be great to, intro, to reintroduce them here, where it's important to emphasize that many of the people repatriated in Sierra Leone, this was done by the Christian Missionary Society, and they settled among the Mande, Mandenge, and other such groups. Whereas the, the, um, the Liberians, like I said before, were founded by the American Colonization Society, whose ideas, even as Christian people, were not noble, right? Because they had been, they did it so the white people of the American Colonization Society uh, repatriated these Africans because they believed the increasing number of black people in the American South made it harder to suppress everyone else. And they forced, when they got to Liberia, they forced the African chiefs to sell them their land at gunpoint to found these communities. Um, so the duplicity of Christian Christianity and the way in which they, they, they treated people is very palpable from the beginning. Um, but the Europeans and, and the Americans and you know the Western world was very invested in pushing this Christian narrative, but they had more success in these two countries than they did in most other places at the time, uh, because these two places had two distinct advantages. First of all, uh, because this, a lot of the people who were here had been repatriated, had been taken into enslavement and repatriated, the black Africans here had already been torn violently from their African traditions and were easier to get through. They were already, they had been torn away from their own culture, but were also already introduced to Christianity and this apparent civilization. So that's a reason why. Then secondly, the Europeans, the Westerners could not get through to the rest of the continent uh, by virtue of language, culture, and disease. They, you know, the folks here already spoke English or at least some varieties of English. So since they had been enslaved before, so it was easier to get through to them uh, as, than it was to get through to the other places. So what they decided to do, the Europeans, was to start building this culture where converts or Christ, Black, African Christians from these places could then go on and lead uh, the ev evangelizing mission across the continent. And one such Christian uh, uh, leader uh, was uh, Samuel Aljai Crowther. Samuel Aljai Crowther, who was, was a Yoruba linguist and was the first African Anglican bishop in Nigeria. So Yoruba, you know, the, the, the big ethnic group out of Nigeria, and that's him pictured here. Um, and he actually led the Christian Missionary Society to the Niger Delta that would go on to help uh, found uh, Sierra Leone. And he was also a founding student of the Fora Bay College, which is very esteemed in, uh, in, 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 in West African um, intellectual tradition. But that's him right here. That's, that's, the, that's the Bishop uh, Samuel Ajay, uh, you know, himself ended up being uh, a Sierra Leonean. Uh, another important person, maybe not so much within, well, he was in, indeed within the Christian tradition as well, but uh, was E.W. Blyden, Edward Wilmot Blyden here, who was actually born in the Virgin Islands, uh, but when he was denied access to an American university, he went on to college in modern day Liberia, where he founded the Liberian Herald, you know, a prominent newspaper, and also was a, was, was a huge believer in this idea of a 
black led version of the civilizing mission that he felt that the Africans who had been enslaved and repatriated had been exposed to Christianity and the virtues of Westernization and could then go along the coast and the interior of Africa and spread that quote unquote good news to the rest of the continent. Um, so in the, this is all in the mid, in the, in the early 19th century. So we see early seeds of what would become Pan-Africanism, which we will spend a lot of time talking about in the following weeks, of what became Pan-Africanism, right? Now, of course, this is uh, tainted with this idea of Western supremacy and, and the civilizing mission, which is very problematic. Uh, but when taken within this time context, you can tell that it was a, he had a Pan-African vision, which with a gift of hindsight may be very flawed, but it was a very important figure. Another important figure was uh, James Africanus Horton, who was born of Igbo parents in Sierra Leone, and what became one of the first people to gain, I, I think he may be the first one to gain a doctorate from uh, Edinburgh College, the first African to get, get a doctorate in Edinburgh College in Scotland. He had also graduated from the, from the same Fura Bay College in Sierra Leone that uh, of which Samuel Ajay Crowther was a founding student of. So again, very important school in this tradition. And uh, the, the, the anecdote with his middle name here, or his Monica Africanus, is um, he had, he did not want people to confuse his name, right? Because a lot of the people who had been repatriated had European sounding names or English sounding names. So Samuel Crowther, James Horton. So he, since he was such an anomaly at the time, having graduated in Scotland, he did not want people to assume on his dissertation that he had been a, a, a white man or a British man. So he put Africanus on the dissertation. So to emphasize that this, this guy was African, so which I thought was a pretty cool tidbit. Um, then one of his more important books that he went on to write was West African Countries and Peoples, A Vindication of the African Race. Again, forerunner to Pan-African literature. But these were also people who were very much believers in, in, in Christianity and its, and its civilizing potential. But very important figures um, who appear problematic when we talk about them with the gift of 21st century hindsight. Um, but or hindsight is 2020, right? Because we are actually in 2020 right now. Ha ha ha. Um, but you know, you know, people must be judged within their context. Um, yeah, so. Now, while that's happening in West Africa, remember we've spoken about how the Dutch had settled in South Africa back in 1652, and the British went on to, the British arrived late in the 18th century, 1795 in particular, in the Cape Colony. Um, so this was way earlier than the scramble for Africa and settlements in other parts of the, of the continent, uh, with the exception of um, the, the Portuguese, where we spoke about had been in West Africa and other parts since the, since the 15th century. So when they, the Dutch initially came, but they, they had their farmers and, and other groups, but they did not have a strong missionary contingent. The missionary contingent came largely with the British at the, at the end of the 18th century and going forward. And um, initially they were, the, the, the missionaries were pretty well welcomed, right? Not, not, not mostly for their, for their religious standing, but for, for their literary and technical expertise, they brought a certain set of skills that would have, that would, that benefited different African communities. So a lot of people brought them in for that, you know, teach them how to read and write and, and other technical skills. And also many kings really appreciated them for, for because they often accompanied with, with firearms, right? They were, so king, kings like, such as King Mushweshwe of Lesotho, uh, who was able to, who converted to Christianity only as a, as a political move, but was able to fortify 
his kingdom uh, of Lesotho early on by way of the support he got from the British as one of the good guys, quote unquote, and uh, the arms that he received from them as well. Um, and when the British arrived in South Africa, they were also somewhat preferred to the Dutch because the Dutch had come in purely on the strength of brute force. And, um, you know, had, had conquered the, the Khoisan and were con constantly uh, feuding with the different groups. The British were not necessarily better people, but with the, <laughs> with the, with the voice of the missionaries, they were able to, who spoke about freeing the, the, the oppressed and these things. The condition of enslaved folks or endangered groups, in, you know, particularly the hands of the Dutch, slightly improved under, the, under the, the influence of British missionaries. Slightly improved. And a lot of that was, one, because it was consistent with the values that they wanted to purport, but also it was a bit to to weaken the, the Dutch a little bit, right? To weaken the, the Dutch's hold on the territory a little bit. So it was never just clearly out of, out of bleeding hearts. Um, in any case, so as well as, as had happened in West Africa, uh, the British people started and, and other missionaries, right? And soon the Dutch Reformed Church ended up being a big deal as well in the region. So the missionaries also sought uh, Africans to help evangelize, help spread the, 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 the good word, if you will, um, because they felt that a lot of times folks would be more reci uh, receptive to their own kind than they would to, to the Europeans who were increasingly unpopular as they showed their, their tyrannical and in intrusive hold on the region. So um, the likes of uh, Bernard Muzeki, in what is now Zimbabwe was a prominent um, early Christian convert who was tasked with, with, with spreading the word to the quote unquote heathens that were his, his, his kinfolk. Um, you have a, a whole group of uh, the Soto population who went on to settle in, in, in modern day Zimbabwe to their north across the Limpopo River, who came with the Dutch Reformed Church. And even though they ended up establishing their own community away from them, they were part of that civilizing mission as well. But a very popular, and um, I will post uh, in, the, in the description section, I will post uh, a wonderful book that a colleague of mine, uh, Mujere, uh, has written on, on that very on that very group, but a prominent uh, figure in that culture was uh, Tio Soga. Um, this gentleman here, looking very British, but he was actually Tosa, uh, and he was the first African from modern South Africa to be ordained, right? Uh, to be ordained as a, as, a, as, a, as a priest, and he went on to marry a Scottish woman. He also might have been one of the very first, uh, you know, uh, Southern African people to to marry a, 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 a Scottish woman. Then he would also, he went, also went on to translate much of the New Testament into Tosa. So he's very, he's a very important figure within this tradition of, of Africans um, developing some agents within the Christian tradition. Now in all this, and I've been hinting at this throughout, that the missionaries themselves came as agents of imperialism. They were not in opposition to the colonial project. They were handmaidens of the colonial project. So Christianity was often weaponized by settlers, right? Where this idea of, this idea of um, being docile, you know, being nonviolent, um, you may suffer on earth, but your reward is in heaven. This was all used sort of to pacify the, 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 the Christians, I mean, the, the, the Africans, into submission, into submission, where they would not rise up against the powers that be, uh, against the colonialists, and sort of assume their place as, a, as an inferior race. Um, so that's what, you know, Christianity would emphasize that all their traditions were heathen, were... Were, were hell bound 
everything you did, from the way you married, from the way you celebrated uh, different occasions, from the way you did this and that, everything was hidden. So it was very, very weaponized uh, by the settlers. Uh, one, one, one author, uh, Walsh, who writes a lot about early South African history, spoke about it as, uh, described it as like being designed to weaken the minds of men into submission by emphasizing that the imperial agenda was God's design and thus in their best interest. So it is, this is what God has desired for, for, for you to be enslaved and be colonized and it is in your best interest to accept it. So this is already Christianity being a, a going hand in hand with the guns and and other atrocities, right? To to enforce the place of of Africans as, as inferior. Now, missionaries would also appeal for political and military military protection from the metropole. So whenever they felt threatened, the the the, the, the missionaries, they would call upon their mother country, right? The British or or, or these groups and they would provide military protection for, for, for them. What does that mean? It means that the, the heavy handed policing and, 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 and military presence in the colony, in what would soon become the colonies, but on the continent was constantly increasing, constantly increasing. And a lot of it was due to the cries of the missionaries, right? And one of the more, one of the saddest and most glaring instances whereby the missionaries used their positionality. And, you know, a lot of them were accepted by these African leaders, if not politically, if not uh, for religious reasons, but for, for political ones, okay? So, and one such tragic case was uh, the relationship that developed between Reverend Hell, uh, who was a British reverend, and um, and King Lobengula of who was of of modern day Zimbabwe, of the Zimbabwean plateau, who was the son of King Muzilika, as we spoke about earlier in the in the Fekane, uh video, um, who had fled um, Shaka's rule and established his own community ultimately in the Zimbabwean plateau. Um, so that relationship is, is, a, is, a, is, a, is a pretty fascinating one because um, the reverend himself ends up betraying King Lobengula, who had earned his trust um, in 1888, you know, over years, right, of relationship, right? So, so and I've bitten around the bush here, so I apologize for that. Uh, Reverend, the Reverend uh, was given this book, these documents, right? I mean, Lobengula was given these documents by, 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 the, by Rudd and other British people who wanted to colonize the territory initially, uh, essentially. And uh, they handed the, the books and Lobengula approached his trusted confidant, uh, Reverend Helm, to help him look at this contract, if it's something he should sign since he understood the language. And the Reverend told him that, yeah, it was, it was fine to go ahead and do that, uh, which he did. And um, it was of course false and it pretty much set in motion the, the colonization. He essentially signed the country away based on the trust he had in the Reverend Helm here. Um, and there's a great quote here that, I don't know if this is the first time it was said, it's often attributed to different people, but Jomo Kenyatta, uh, the founding father of modern Kenya, uh, has, was known to say this. When the missionaries came to Africa, they had the Bible and we had the land. They said, let us pray. We closed our eyes and when we opened them, we had the Bible and they had the land. So this <laughs> kind of points to this idea of missionaries sort of bamboozling, um, you know, playing a critical role as agents of imperialism. Now, even as this was happening in the 19th century, it, is, it would be asinine to, and ahistorical to think that the Africans had no agency and, and did not push back in any way. Uh, and one of the ways in which they did that was through the, the idea of Ethiopianism. 
And Ethiopianism is a type of Christianity that has its roots. Well, we can talk about its roots in two ways. It is rooted in the, in the idea of, of the biblical verse that says, princes shall come out of Egypt and Ethiopia shall stretch forth her hands unto God, which is in Psalms. And this is the idea of, of African revival, African Renaissance. That's how people took it to mean. And the culture of Ethiopianism grows out of the African Methodist Episcopal churches in the U.S., these separate, separationist, ch separatist churches, uh, or what we call black churches in the U.S., right? A lot of these churches were part of the Underground Railroad. These were the churches of, of black people that were closely tied to, to uh, resistance to oppression in the U.S., okay? So these churches have been around for, from the 18th and 19th century in the U.S., and we'll tie, we'll tie it back to that in a little bit. So Ethiopianism is this gospel, is this idea of using Christianity, the same tool that had been oppressed to, used to oppress black people, to use it as a means of inciting revolution, right? By citing the scripture here that Africa's time is coming. Africa's time is coming. That's what the, the thing of Ethiopianism is, that the, the essence of Ethiopianism is. So by 1850 in South Africa, right, the, the, European, the British had gotten around to opening a bunch of missionary, Christian missionary schools. And by 1850, only 9,000 African students were enrolled in these mission schools. The number grew so exp exponentially that by, 100, by 1900, 50 years later, that number had, uh, had gone up by more than 10 times to 100,000 Africans. The problem though was at the time there were no, the South African universities were not accepting black students, right? So African students. So when they would graduate, a lot of them would get scholarships to, to the UK uh, or to the US. And the ones who went to the US uh, encountered these AMEs, these African Methodist Episcopal churches, and essentially got introduced this idea of Ethiopianism, which ended up uh, revol which uh, radicalized them, right? So in 1884, the Temple Church was founded as, uh, as with the same sort of separatist ideals, right? Broke away from, I believe, the Dutch Reformed Church and started to speak the language of AMEs. And in 1892, the Ethiopian Church broke away from Wesleyan, again, the Wesleyan, another t uh, prototypical European church, and they broke away from that and actually became a district of the AMEs, of the, of the AMEs as headquartered in the USA, right? So you can see this radicalization that is happening. Remember, slavery has been an institution in the US for 200 years at this point. So the African-American population, the black people of the US are already radicalized at this point, or at least segments of them are already radicalized. So some of that radicalization is being imparted to places like uh, through the church here. Um, so indeed, so this is the rise of radicalism. This is late 19th century. And let's talk about what it looked like in, in, in essence. One of the, one of the people who, who embodies this was uh, uh, John Dube, Reverend John Dube, who after he graduated, after he was done with high school in, the, in, in South Africa, got a scholarship to Oberlin College in the USA uh, in 18, and while, in eight, while there in 1892, he gave a well-known speech, a very fantastic speech, in which he again he cited the, that Ethiopian uh, uh, call for Euro Ethiopians spreading out, stretching out their hands in 1892 in a talk called a, talk, a Familiar Talk Upon My Native Land. I'll put the link to that, to that uh, historic document in the description as well. That's in 1892. His cousin, Pixley Stammer, had gotten a scholarship to, when ended up going to Columbia College in the US as well. So some of them, others even attended um, HBCUs in the US um, to, and where they also got radicalized that way. In 1897, the song that I opened the video with in Kosa Sikileli was written by Enoch Sontonga and went on to become a very important song as I explained earlier. It would be the song that would be founded at the, at the performed 
at the founding of the South African Native National Congress, S-A-N-N-C, uh, or the ANC, if you will. We what later became the African National Congress, which is the party that's still in power to South Africa today, the first nationalist organized, black African nationalist organization in Southern Africa. And it was performed by the Orlando Institute, which is a which was a group that had been founded, uh, an institute that had been founded by John Dube in the mold of the Tuskegee Institute by Booker T. Washington. So pay attention to all those Pan-African connections. And Kosesigaleli would go on to be, to be uh, co-opted in the struggle, anti-colonial struggle in Zaire, uh, North and South Rhodesia, which are now Zimbabwe and Zambia by the 1930s. And it went on to become the national anthem in South Africa, of course, post-colonial Zimbabwe, Zambia, Namibia, and Tanzania. And the SANNC, which later on went on to become the ANC, founded by Reverend John Dube and with other men of the cloth, African men of the cloth in its ranks, would become, like I said, was the first nationalistic political organization for Africans in Southern Africa, but went on to inspire a host of others, right, which are similarly named, including the Nyasaland African Congress in Malawi, Southern Rhodesian African National Congress in what is now Zimbabwe, and Northern Rhodesian African National Congress in what is now Zambia. Okay, why is this important? Well, the same folks who had gone to this uh, mission schools, the likes of Reverend John Dube, would go, you know, the same gospel that had been used to oppress them or to keep them docile or to force them into submission ended up working, you know, to radicalize them and ended up resulting in them establishing what would snowball to be a, a large anti-colonial sentiment and, and, and nationalistic uh, sentiment across not just the country, but across the region as a whole. So this is the ways in which um, these uh, early converts who had the privilege of, of, of education and these things were able to use their platform, not as handmaidens of, of colonialism, but actually against it. So this is, this is important to note indeed. So what are some of the key takeaways here? Um, well, understand what the civilizing mission was, right? What, what does the civilizing mission mean? And I will also add to know who some of the earliest Christians who were, um, uh, who, uh, Africans who were converted into Christianity were, right? I will spoke about Sierra Leone and Liberia a little bit, uh, to know about how missionaries stand as agents of imperialism and just to be able to define the essence of Ethiopianism, as well as maybe uh, recognize some of its most important figures. So these are some of the key takeaways. I think there's a lot more key takeaways to this, but this is something that I would just encourage you to dwell on until, until we meet next time. Thank you so much for joining us and I hope you've enjoyed this. If you have, make sure you leave a like, a comment, you share it and you subscribe to the channel. Thank you so much. And I will see you next time.